related to that. And so one of the things I know that we talk about organizationally is this whole idea that um, your environment, the first thing is your environment always wins, right? There's a theory that says that. When, and again, when we talk about environment, there's physical environment, mental environment, there's multiple environments, it's not just, not just physical, but your environment always wins. And then within our work, one of the things that we talk about is this whole idea of one of the drivers to incarceration and recidivism is our socialization. And individuals build a certain set of social skills to be able to navigate an environment. I think you described it, and, and I'm kind of calling it out and teasing that out, um, around how do I survive there? And oftentimes, it's hard to then go into a new environment with new skills. How have you each have been able to develop a new set of social skills to be able to operate and navigate new environments? Because obviously you had to adopt um, new skills for the environments that you were in. Um, I, I think I learned how to, this is a, maybe a, a slightly unique approach to answering the question. Um, I, I learned how to do a lot of things that I didn't know how to do, and I learned to appreciate how I could be helpful to this. That's why the comment about the, doing something with duty really resonated with me. Because I learned how to be helpful in ways that I didn't know to incline myself to be helpful. And so, for example, like I got a paralegal certificate to be able to help the women like deal with whatever we were trying to figure out that was wrong with the case and no one would help me. So then I bring that out and I, I'm trying to leverage that ability to identify how to be helpful to, to do more of that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, for me, uh, it, it was the ability to adapt to uh, different personalities different uh, uh, geographic people that have came from different geographical locations. And I'm not just talking about just the inmates, but even the guards, right? I think being able to um, have communication with them. I mean, when you first get in prison, I mean, guards are the people that you don't want to have conversations with, right? I mean, they it's, it's frowned upon, right, to have conversations with guards or to even, um, you know, be friendly uh, with them whatsoever. Um, but I think that, um, having that experience of, again, being in a, a, a place that technically you're calling home, right, for so many years, uh, you have to, right? It comes to a point where you have to have these communications where you have to be friendly with people and it's not all about people who are from Philly. It's not all about people who are African-American. It's, it's not always about that. So when you start to uh, uh, spread your wings somewhat, start to communicate with other people, I think that uh, played a huge role and um, coming out and understanding that a not all authority figures are horrible, right? And that 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 is a stereotype that doesn't that doesn't sit well uh, with me at all. Um, and that, you know there are people of different geographical backgrounds, different races, different everything that are there to help, and they're genuine about helping you, not just because it's their job, but it's, it's in their heart to be able to do that. And you know uh, I have people now that I communicate with on a regular basis that were guards, that were guarding me while I was in federal prison. I have people now that have invited me to parties and done things. Uh, one gentleman in particular, a guard, he just retired. Uh, my mother, Mr. Beakley, she knows. Um, he just retired from the Federal Bureau of Prison, and I was one of the first people that he reached out to and said, hey, I'm retiring. Come out here for my party, you know? So this is, this is one of the things that, you know, those kind of like, he, he genuinely helped me while I was inside. And I can honestly say that without his help, um, that I would uh, I wouldn't be where I am uh, today. And this is a gentleman that is far from anyone that I would have ever communicated with previous to prison. I mean, the prison is in you know if you know anywhere about uh, prisons at all in Pennsylvania, they're all in the mountains, right? They're not, there's, there's not, they're all they're all in the mountains, and everybody that's in those in those areas they work in those prisons, right? And when you're leaving the prison to go anywhere, that's when you start to notice how mountainous it is. This region is you know crazy. They're all out there hunting deer and doing things and doing things that you would never imagine yourself doing, but then they come inside and, you know, they, they, they show you another side to them. And um, I think that that helped me a great deal, um, being able to come home and communicate with, you know, different people. So, you know, but Barry said it all for me. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely did. He definitely uh, touched up on what I was going to say, but I uh, already mixed it in my way. Uh, for me, what got me through to be able to uh, do you know, uh, be socially uh, intelligent in prison. 
emotionally intelligent as well, but then come to do the same thing into society was, you know, it's generic, it's sound, I put God first. When I put God first, I learned to love myself. When I learned how to love myself, I was able to love others. When I was able to love others, as to your point, there was no inmate versus guard. I was a human being, and I learned how to get along with human beings. When I learned how to get along with human beings, I started seeing that people took an interest in me. And it was easy to uh, bring this back into society because at the end of the day, that's all. We are all human beings dealing with our own different things. And I was involved in a group called Understanding Me. It should have been called Understanding Us because to your point, when we did, we came together. And no matter what your color was, how old you was, your geographical location, or your religious uh, affiliation, we just learned how to talk things out and understand each other. Uh, and that caused less friction. And when I learned how to do that, coming out into society was just a basically a <laughs> I like to echo essentially what everyone said, but I want to do it and say it in some concrete terms that apply to my life. Um, the police as an institution had a point of origin. If you study it and bring it forward to today, you can see the policies that, that were behind it, that drove it. So in prison, I don't talk to the police. Um, most of our squad, we didn't acclimate the prison. I never unpacked. I was there 33 years and I had never once unpacked. And every escape plot anywhere in the prison, um, I factored in in some kind of way. They would transfer me from one prison to the next. And as soon as I come through the door, the members talking to me like I was the Pied Piper and wanted to know which was the quickest exit. Mm -hmm. There came a time that I could look into the face of the officer and see myself. What governs is what we believe and our values. So for me, when I got to the point that I finally was able to knit together how we are all really connected, it allowed me now to move past that past the divisions, and still be trying to escape. <laughs> yes, I'm saying, I'm, you know, oppression is not going to be something I'm going to normalize. I don't care how it came about. And uh, by the time I left prison, <clears throat> before I left prison, I, there's an instance where I hadn't seen a friend in a while, and when I saw him, I was so enthusiastic about saying, I just snatched him up and picked him up in the air. And he melted right in my arms. And when I sat him down, I was trying to figure out what was that? And as I'm walking through Crater Four Prison, I'm looking at the faces of the men, and everybody has their gang face on. And I thought to myself then, it's just not enough love in here. Fast forward to so everybody I agree, I pick them up, provided I got permission. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going through a checkpoint. My man is coming through. I greet him, snatch him up, throw him over my shoulder. I sit him there. I had already spoke to the police. I sat him down. The police barked at me and said, you self, how come I don't never get a hug? <laughs> <laughs> I reached, I walked back to the checkpoint, reached over and snatched this man up, rifle in one part of his hand, gun on the other side, and just squeezed him. <laughs> sat him down and kept right on walking. It's the values. It's the fact that we are each other, but we don't recognize it and we don't practice it. And so for me, that's what the job is. The job is for us to this is not to say put yourself in a vulnerable situation where people abuse you. I mean, you still got to use discretion and be legitimate in the, and present to what all the factors are in your social encounter. But you got to get to the bottom line of we are each other. And ain't nobody coming to save us but us.
Yes, we can't have too many thank yous tonight, can we? Because what we want to say is, tonight, there is enough love in this room. So let's go spread it. <laughs> We're so wonderful. Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. And thank each of you for being here. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.